But he's not just any man. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he still has his composure about him. He's hanging on the cross. And then he decides when he's going to die. And he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And that's when he chose to die. He laid his life down when he wanted to. The proof that he's indeed dead comes when Pilate gives the order to break the legs of those who are hanging on a cross because the next day would be the Passover and they want all the dead bodies. They want them all dead and they want them taken off so they wouldn't be out in public during that day. So when you look at John 19, if you'll turn there with me, John 19, you'll read this account of what takes place. If you start with the 31st verse, we'll look through the following that. It says, therefore, because it was preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. The command was given to go and break the legs of those hanging on the cross because if they broke the legs of those hanging on the cross, they could not support themselves anymore and pick themselves up and take another breath. Matter of fact, if they broke their legs, they wouldn't be able to push up at all and they would, they would die quicker because they could not get the air. They would suffocate because they had no strength to put them. And they're, they're talking about seriously breaking their legs, like hitting a 4x4 four four, putting it and a sludge hammer over top of it and hitting it as hard as they can so they broke all their legs and there's nothing to support them. They were going to split to their legs. They weren't just going to break them. They want to make sure there's no strength in them so they would die quicker. That's what they're trying to do is, is speed up their death. So they break the legs of the first man. You can imagine the, the pain that would cause it. The second man, they did that too. When they came to Jesus, there was no reason to break his legs. They didn't have the spear of his death. He was already dead. And just to make sure, they took the spear and stuck him on the heart side and blood and water poured out, meaning that enough water had come around the heart that his heart had stopped beating and he would have the cardiac arrest. He would, it would have stopped. And once he pierced it and the water and the blood came out, they knew he was dead. He was dead. There was no pulse. No blood kept coming out because there was no heart pumping. He was dead. He was completely dead. No, those events did not take Jesus by surprise. He was surprised when Judas came to trade him. He knew that before he set him on to do it. And said before the foundation of the world, this was determined that he would die for us. That he also prophesied several times of his death. He did this with his enemies as well as his followers. He let everybody know what was going to happen. So he let his enemies know that he wouldn't to kill me. He let his followers know they are going to kill me and I'll be back in three days. He, this was not the first time he shared this. He shared it over and over with those who loved him and those who hated him both. But I want to look at the one final gospel of John chapter 10. So if you'll turn to verses 17 18 in John chapter 10, that's what we'll be looking at this morning. This is about midway through his ministry. And he's talking to the Pharisees. He's letting them know he had just rebuked them and they came and questioned him more. And this is the response that he gives him. Therefore, my father loves me because I laid down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down with myself. I have the power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This is the command I received from my father. <coughs> So he lets his enemies there and his disciples are gathered. He's telling them both, I'm in control when I die and I'm in control when I lift my life back up. You're not taking anything from me. I'm giving it. I want you to look at verse 17 again. The father loves the son because the son laid down his life that the son may take again. He's sharing the death and resurrection of himself. My father loves me because I choose to lay down my life so I can choose to take it back up again. That's what the text is saying. He's letting his enemies knowing that he is willingly laying down his life and he will pick it back up again. He wouldn't kill me. But I'm choosing when I die and the he did. And I will come back to life when I return. 
and he did. So willingly, Jesus died, and he would choose when he would live again, and it's already been determined. After three days, he would come back to the dead. So he already made that statement. He made a similar statement at the very beginning of his ministry in the front of his enemies as well. When he cleansed the temple for the first time, he went in there and turned over the tables and the money changers and those who sell doves. He made this ruckus and he said, Give us a sign why you do these things. What authority do you have to do these? And he gave them this sign. Matter of fact, the answer in John 2, 19, verse 20, 19 to 22 says, to destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it's taken 40 and 6 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the words of Jesus had said. Then they did. Now, when he said it, they had no idea what he was talking about. His enemies didn't know. He said, no, 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 you got it wrong. Destroy this temple, and I will raise it in three days. He was saying, I know you're going to kill me, and in three days, I'm going to raise myself back up. That's the statement he was making. But they misunderstood him. He said, wait a minute. We're, we're in Herod's temple right now. It's still in construction, and they've been working on it 46 years, and you won't raise it in three days? Not that he couldn't, mind you. But he said, no, it's my body. You're going to destroy it. And I'm going to raise it back up in three days. And there's an interesting phrase in, in verse 22 there when you look at it. It says, And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. After the resurrection, they, they believed two things. They believed the scripture. What well, scripture? All they had was the Old Testament. The New Testament hadn't been written yet. So they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus said, which would be our gospel of the New Testament, they believed his word. So what scripture did they believe? Well, there's several in the Old Testament that talk about the resurrection of Christ, but one is Psalm 1610. And it's got resurrection all over it when you focus on it. See, in Psalm 1610, it says, You will not leave my soul in shield, nor will you allow your holy one to see corruption. That's resurrection passage. You're not going to leave him. He's going to be dead. He's just not going to be left dead. He'll be placed in a borrowed tomb, and all these things are spoken of. But this is one of the main resurrection passages tucked away in the Psalms. You're not going to leave my soul in the place of the dead. And his body's not going to see corruption because it doesn't start to decompose until after several days. He's going to be raised from the dead. This is one of the passages that Peter preached at Pentecost when 3,000 people came to Christ. This is one of the resurrection passages he used to show that Jesus Christ, it was prophesied that he would come back to life after he was killed. He wouldn't stay dead. He would be resurrected. And this is one of those that Peter preached. And 3,000 came to know Christ. But that's one of the main texts that he used. Now I want us to look back at the book of John. And I want to finish up on a statement in John 10. When we get to John 10 and the 18th verse, he says, no one takes my life from me. But I lay it down of myself. I'm giving my life. It happens that again when, when Peter pulled out the sword and put off the servant of the high priest Malchus' ear, Jesus said, Peter, Peter, put your sword away. Don't you get it? If I wanted this in, I could say the word right now. Twelve legions of angels would come and this would be over. I can quit this anytime I want. I can make it go away. It's not going to. So put your sword up and let the scriptures be fulfilled. So no one takes it from me. I lay it down myself. And then he says, I have the power to lay it down. And I have the power to take it again. This is command I received from the Father. He's commanded, you die, you come back. That's command and you obey. He says, I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to pick it up again. 
He makes a statement that no one takes a Bible and said he chose to give, give it. And he adds some clarification. I have the power to do this. Exosia. It, it conveys that word power, superhuman ability and authority to do this. Because quite frankly, no human can choose to die and choose to come back to life whenever they want. It, it would take this type of power, the ecclesia power, where you have superhuman authority to do this. And it was a command from the Father, so he got the command from the Father, but he had the power to do that in himself. He had the power when he breathed his last. He gave up the most. He chose when he was going to die. Someone else may have died before he ever got to the cross. But he held on and then he decided who he was going to die on the cross. And then he decided who he would come back on the third day. Because he had the power to do that. He had this divine power, this resurrection power that rocked the entire world. And no other religion has a savior who has ecclesia. They don't have it. No one else has this divine resurrection power. No one has a risen Savior except Christians. They serve a God who came back from the dead of his own volition. And then there's a promise that he's given us that we will experience that same resurrection that he had. The ones that was recorded, the ones who had seen it. And Paul makes this claim in Philippians chapter 3. He talks about experiencing the resurrection of himself that he will participate in this as well. So if you look at Philippians 3, 10, 11 with me. This is where Paul is writing to the church in Philippi, and he's pouring out his heart in the third chapter. He says, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So I'm all in with Jesus. I'm all in with him. I want to know him completely. I want to know the power of the resurrection myself. I want to experience that. 